His approval rating has gone up. It's only 49% in one poll, but in the poll averages, it's 44, 45%, which for him is very high. He is in some ways is at his strongest point when he's not, not out in front of the public all the time, because when he is out in front of the public constantly, you see what you saw today, which is the white hot center of Donald Trump, which is just a man consumed by grievances. Someone who doesn't understand anything about civic virtue, about morality, <clears throat> about the rule of law, about right and wrong. Somebody who sees the world based on who's with me and who's against me. And I think, you know, today he might as well have been out there saying, you know, I want Mitt Romney's head on a pike. I want, I, I want Lisa Page and Pete Strzok and everyone against me. I want their heads on the pike. The words that Republican senators offended, pretended to be so offended about when Adam Schiff used them. Because last Saturday. That's, yeah, last Saturday. Because that's what he was doing. He was attacking and making clear the consequences for anyone that crosses him. And also saying, and this is really important for Republicans, that if you stand with me, if you'll be one of my sycophants, you can come to the White House and I will praise you on national television. He went through and had all these me members of Congress and senators stand up. You'll get your primetime bookings on Fox. You'll be part of the team and you'll be rewarded. And if you're not, I will come at you with everything I have. So Andrew Weissman is on a team. It's a mafia family. And that's how Jim Comey described him. Donald Trump spent a lot of time attacking Jim Comey anew today, um, a lot of time um, airing his grievances with the Mueller investigation, which you were a part of. How does that land inside the FBI workforce when the attorney general is sort of chortling away in the front row? Well, I do think the FBI people there keep their head down. And it's a very apolitical, let's just do the job uh, kind of uh, organization. But that's not about politics but, right left. That's about corruption writ large. Yeah. No, look, people are going to be people are going to be concerned about whether they're allowed to just follow the facts and apply the law. Like, is there going to be interference? And clearly, from the president's point of view, there was an odd moment where he's kept on sort of looking over in the press conference to the attorney general as if that's just somebody who carries out what he wants to do, which is traditionally not what the role of the attorney general is. It's traditionally not the role of an attorney general to sit at a political rally, which was what this was. I, I was surprised to see him in the room. And, and those references, we should be very explicit with our viewers. He's talking about going out and getting all those people he attacked in the Durham probe. So I don't know, Mr. Durham, but he should be very concerned by what Donald Trump just promised his base in the East Room. Well, absolutely. I mean, but the, the, I think one of the things, if I were the Democrats looking at this, what I would be doing is making two points to, to sort of criticize what's going on. One is a complete absence of facts. What you have here is classic demagoguery, which is it's all adjectives, evil, corrupt. And, you know, in the case of the Mueller folks, it was we were angry. Um, none of that has to do with the facts. Um, so I think um, you know, there was something very interesting when the Italians were trying to get rid of Berlusconi, and they had a, a very, very similar demagogue who also was amoral. And one of the ways they did it was you don't just talk about his you know, personal failings. You go to the facts and you talk about why his policies are wrong. And I think that's what the Democrats have to point out, that all of this is just adjectives. There's actually a complete dearth of the president saying, what exactly is wrong with these people? What have they, what have they actually said that's incorrect? And the second point is, it is noticeable that the president mouths off today about this. But where was he at, in the House? Where was he in the Senate? Mm -hmm. He never submitted to an interview. He never testified under oath. It's true. The same happened in the Mueller case. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's a classic reason. There is legal jeopardy that attaches if you sit for an interview or if you um, say something under oath to federal prosecutors, to the House, to the Senate. So if you notice, the president is happy to talk today about, oh, this is evil and these people are corrupt. But when it came time for him to sort of put up or shut up, which is, are you willing to actually say this under oath or even in an interview, he's completely silent. So to me, one classic way of dealing with this is to say, you know, a lot of your people testified and they were willing to come in and say something under oath mm -hmm. under the penalty of perjury where were you well he was he was getting ready for this there's a big party in the issue uh, rick stangle i'm sure you share my um despair at seeing the room just like this this yeah. is a room that when you have the privilege of working in the white house it's the grandest room i think it's where fdr laid in state um it's where wars declared pieces announced um Medals of Freedom are handed out, I guess, in the, with the exception of Rush Limbaugh's. But it is a grand room, and it was used to say the sorts of things um, usually saved in, with this president for a political rally.
Yes, I mean, I, I heard John earlier say he's not going to express how appalled he was because he's done it so often. But I'm going to express how appalled I was today <laughs> by it. I mean, I, and I couldn't help but think these senators sitting in the room and listening to him rail on like this. And by the way, people, voters should be forced to listen to an entire Trump press conference because then I think it's impossible to vote for him. But they've got to be sitting there and thinking, what a poor excuse for a president. What a poor excuse for a man. What a poor excuse for a human being. And I voted to acquit him. And we've been talking about what the Democrats have, have to do. The, the issue, I think, is, is the continuum between people who think we have a good economy, mm -hmm. of whom there are 60 percent of Americans. And traditionally, an incumbent president gets a majority of those voters. Right. But in all these recent polls, he only gets about 55 percent of the people who think we have a good economy. Barack Obama got nine out of 10 of those people in 2012. So the more people see this appalling vision of Donald Trump, the less they, they may discount that for, for, the, for, the, for, for the good economy. It does, can I, it does can I ask Andrew yeah, one ahead. question? Sure. I'm sorry. To, that's, no. Why we use the word acquit? Why don't we use the word, not the phrase not guilty or not proven about this impeachment trial? Because he's not acquitted. He's, it was simply not proven. There was no evidence offered. So every, this ubiquity of the wor word acquit and him holding up that thing like Harry Truman, you know, Dewey defeats Truman is is kind of a problem, I would say. Well, I do think technically it is correct to say either not guilty or acquit. I mean, it, you may say it has none of the attributes of a tr real trial, but it was a trial. Um, if you were on the Republican side, you would say, well, we didn't call live witnesses, but we did have the record. Um, before the House in front of us. So it is the case that there was some evidence for them that not, the Democrats would say, not a complete record, and there was a lot more to get. But there was some evidence. Um, of course, you know, if you're a Democrat, you say, well, what were you afraid of? There were clear witnesses, including mm -hmm. witnesses who were not otherwise available. Where does that terminology even come from? I mean, the Constitution doesn't say, the Constitution says the Senate has to try him and is responsible for trying him. It doesn't say if the Senate does not convict him, he's acquitted. Yeah, but you need to say something. So whether it's acquitted or not guilty or not proven, it's still the same. Well, all right, we're going to move okay. um, the legal eagles <laughs> off uh, over into the break. I'll, I'll film it for you if you want. I want to get to you, Ashley Parker. And you have this great um, sort of term of saying the quiet part out loud. I want to show you this moment where Donald Trump went back to where it all began with Hunter Biden and seemed to suggest or maybe try to normalize the idea of his children enriching themselves on the presidency. Let's watch. But they don't think it's corrupt when a son that made no money, that got thrown out of the military, that had no money at all, is working for $3 million up front, 83000 a month, and that's only Ukraine. Then goes to China, picks up $1.5 billion. Then goes to Romania, I hear, and many other countries. They think that's okay. Because if it is, is Ivanka in the audience? Is Ivanka here? Boy, my kids could make a fortune. <laughs> I think they could make a fortune. It's corrupt. <laughs> his kids are making a fortune. And I think Ivanka takes his chair at Global Summits. And I think they all stuff brochures in their pockets on Air Force One. I mean, what, 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 the, I, I guess it's the audacity that's either staggering or appalling or somewhat impressive. I mean, what, what is that line that maybe Ivanka should do it? Well, it's not just that he says the quiet part out loud. We've also frequently written that one of his greatest political assets is his shamelessness and is the ability to take something that he is doing or his family is doing or a charge that could be leveled against him and level that same charge back on a sort of a, a lesser crime with 10 times the strength um, and the sense of righteousness. Um, and, and he does that repeatedly. And I think it catches people off guard, even though it shouldn't be, because they sort of cannot believe the audacity of a man doing the very thing that he is accusing someone else of doing. And I think that was a little again, this speech was very um, speech isn't even quite the right word, but it was very sort of off the cuff and free form. I don't know that he, you know, intentionally planned it, but but it's just sort of classic uh, for how he behaves. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.